It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is the one and only John O'Leary, and we're going to be discussing his amazing new book, In Awe, Rediscover Your Childlike Wonder to Unleash Inspiration, Meaning and Joy. John, it is truly an honor. Welcome to the show. Sean, man, my pleasure, and thank you for that wonderful intro. Well, I like to begin every interview with a bit of what we might call the author's origin story. So for the listeners, the viewers, those of us who are meeting John O'Leary for the very first time today, what are a few things we need to know about you? First thing you should know is I'm married, I have four kids, live in the Midwest, and am considered by myself to be the most lucky, most fortunate guy I've ever met. And I've met a lot of folks along the way. So I have a charmed life today, and that might surprise people. Because part of the origin story is so difficult. At age nine, I was burned in a house fire on 100% of my body. So that's everything. 87% of those burns were third degree, which means the skin will never naturally grow back. I lost my fingers due, down to the knuckles due to amputation. Spent five months in hospital, a couple of years of surgery and therapy. So it sounds like a terrifically tragic story. And yet here we are, and I'm claiming, and, and uh, I mean it. I feel as lucky and as blessed and as fortunate as anyone I've ever met. So it's, it's a wild journey. I did not always feel that way, but I certainly do today. Well, in, in getting ready for the interview, John, I was taking a look at some of your social media content and you know, looking at the topics of your two books. It's clear that you've got a new place where you understand the mandate on your life is to teach others how to live an inspired life. And I'd be curious to hear, when did you realize that was the calling on your life to maybe be this voice? or this catalyst to unlock or unleash inspiration for others? There, there had to be a point where it's like, man, this is my thing and I'm going for it. Yeah, right. So, and usually it's not your thing. It's, it's everybody else telling you this ought to be your thing and you're the last one of the party. So that, that's the way it was for me. Uh, I, at age nine, like I said, I got burned, spent a year out of school, a year away from friends, eventually came back different than everybody else, Sean. So my goal in life was to fit in like everybody else. So the exact opposite of, I think, what you're really called to do to, to lead forward. And so I, um, in high school, I was funnier than everybody else. I started drinking more than everybody else. The same thing in college, continued to try to put on this persona of someone who I really wasn't, if I'm being honest about it, to such a degree that when I graduated university, everybody else was taking jobs and I wanted to prove to the world how normal I was. And so I started a job, started a career as a contractor. So uh, it was me up on roofs, sheeting roofs. It was me hanging kitchen cabinets and re refurbishing these buildings with hands that can barely hold a, a hammer. I was fixing this up and it's only in, in 2020, looking back that we recognize kind of who we were and how we were showing up. And I think now that I've had a couple decades to reflect on it, what I was really doing is trying to scream to the world, look how ordinary I am. I can do everything just like everybody else. And and then at age 28, I got a call from a Girl Scout in third grade saying, Mr. O'Leary, would you share your story for my troop? So I thought she had the wrong number. I thought she meant my dad because I'm 28, man. I'm not Mr. Nobody. I'm John. And I said, what do you mean? And she goes, I, I heard about your story. I'd love for you, for you to share. And so whether it's a podcast like this or a, a third grade class, I always I, and I just try to be open to saying yes. I try to hold everything with my hands wide open. So I said yes, and I practiced for like 40 hours. I'm not exaggerating. Went to this little troop, got sick in the parking lot on the walk-in, put a piece of gum in, walked into the school building, looked down at my notes, Sean, for the entire 12 minutes, never once looked up those little monsters, did not even get paid with a box of Samoas, but that, that's my first gig, man. And that was 15 years ago. And the 15 years that have followed, I've spoken now 2,000 times in 50 states and 20 countries, a couple million people by saying yes to the next best opportunity in front of me and ultimately not doing it for myself. So it's not an ego-fueled mission. It's selfless. It's about life. It's about love. It's about encouraging people to wake up and to recognize the profound beauty that is their life and challenge them to maybe do a little bit more with that life going forward. Well, in, in my profession, I work with authors on a daily basis. I interview tons of authors for the podcast. And one of the things that I find ever fascinating is who they had in their mind's eye. When, when you were working on that manuscript and writing page after page, who were the people that you were thinking of as those ideal readers, the people that you were hoping would pick up this book? That's an awesome question. So only a guy who interviews a ton of authors would ask it because it's kind of outside the box. The reality is uh, writing a book 
it can either be a very impersonal piece or an incredibly personal piece. So you're either you're writing this thing to hopefully sell to the masses, which is a huge mistake in my mind, or you write hoping that maybe one day your kid will pick it up and read it. And if you write it that intimately, that personally, it's my belief that the masses will, will be drawn to it. And so when I write a book, uh, when I write a newsletter, even I always write with one person in mind. When I write a chapter, I write with one person in mind. And so the book that we're talking about today in awe each of the chapters are written with one person that I know, man, you need to read this, Sean. My wife, her name is Beth. I wrote a chapter in there, and I'm not going to tell you which one because it's actually very personal. But I w- wrote one chapter just with Beth in mind. It doesn't start with Dear Beth, but every word, every story, every fact in there, it's my hope that she reads this and she sees something within her life that she was missing before she read it. And I think if you choose to write something that personal, when you bump into it, and you and I have never met before, all of a sudden, you're like, man, this is so vulnerable, so real, so authentic. And then you flip the page because you want to learn more about what's true in your life. I, I think that's always how it's worked. There's a guy named Henry Nowen. Henry Nowen, prolific writer, spiritual guy. He wrote something to the effect of what is most personal is most universal. So the very thing that you think is going to be kind of make you a freak, so odd, so unusual, is the very thing that draws people towards you. Yeah, it's so true. The more we're real, the more we're sometimes raw and just honest. That's what makes us human. That's what makes us relatable. And that allows other people to connect with our story. No doubt about it. And for me, in sharing my personal story from platforms, because for me, that's where it began, not in books, but on stages. It always amazed me when I was able to speak and share part of my story with this group, whether it's three Girl Scouts or a couple thousand folks, that afterwards, the line would form, people would come up. In the old days, they would give me a big, huge hug. They would wipe their tears and they would say, "Uh, your story is just like mine. And then they would go on and talk about a divorce or a bankruptcy or a lousy childhood or a horrible marriage or a a miserable job or whatever the thing is. And if you're not careful, you're going to think, man, that's nothing like a burn story. And yet it's a life story. It's a story of these ebbs and flows, these peaks and valleys that draws forward. And if you pay attention, you realize the valleys don't have to be negative. They can, in fact, over time be redeemed to be the best part of the journey. I think any hero's journey without a valley is not worth reading or watching, that's for sure. Well, I think if any of us sit down and we're honest, we can all think of ways that we've lost sight of, you know, that sense of childlike awe, that sense of childlike wonder. And before we get into the meat of the book, as far as what you're going to walk us towards restoring in our lives, what are some of the things that steal that awe, that wonder away from us? Because there was a time when we had it, but bit by bit, it's been chipped away. What happened? So, you know, to answer that, I almost need to back all the way out and say like, so John, why'd you write the book in awe? And this is it. So I would speak at these large organizations and I won't name drop, but you know, we're in front of, we're in stadiums and arenas, big, big audiences. So these are companies you would have heard of and you see these adults and these are the best leaders among us who look almost bored when they're at a conference. They they look almost like they're forced to be there sometimes. And then you go into the boardrooms and it feels like you're pulling teeth to get the best out of individuals. And then I would leave these big, important meetings, walk into schoolhouses, and these kids would skip into the room. And then I would ask a question like, uh, how many of you have ever thought about going to space? Every single hand would pop up. At the end of my presentation, I would ask, does anybody have any questions? Every single little hand would pop up. And then I would come home, Sean, and, and have dinner, tuck the kids in, take them to school the following day. They would get out of the car, and they would skip into the school building. And I noticed this massive dichotomy between how we adult leaders show up and how these kids naturally show up. And so then you got to ask yourself, if you see it enough, why is that? And is there a better way to return to how we once did life? We as kids are far less judgmental. If you have a problem with the way my hands look, rather than looking and then looking away and then walking away, you ask. If you have a problem with the way my skin tone is different than yours, rather than judging me and acting like it's something wrong, you walk right over to me. You say, why is your face different? Your hands are different. And I answer. And then it's over. It's behind us. We don't build walls, man. We're constantly building bridges to connect with one another. And I think that begins by looking in the mirror. There is no ego. Literally, little kids don't brush their hair. They barely brush their teeth when they're little. And then they learn what it means to be normal. And that can be helpful. You want a kid to be well hygiened. You want a kid to brush their teeth and wash their hands from time to time. But you also don't necessarily want them to check every box because we tell them to. And as we instruct them through life, when they think outside the box, they're told they're wrong. 
this is not just an education issue. It's a parenting and a leadership issue. We are told there's a right way and there's a wrong way. The kids who do it the right way get the gold star and the A's and they get to sit even closer to the teacher. Those who do it the wrong way, we get penalized and that we take note of that. And we start to think that that's the way to go through life. And so I, I wrote in awe to remind me, to remind my wife, to remind our readers that there might be a better way to go through life. And it may not be something you need to learn. It might actually be something you need to relearn. Because I, I think what we once had is what we want to relearn to do life more authentically going forward. Well, and the big journey, the big adventure, if you will, uh, that you want to take us on in this book is this journey of rediscovering five key senses, those things that we innately possessed when we were children, before they all got shipped away. Uh, we don't have time to cover all five in this interview, but I'd love to have you touch on a few of them. And, and in this kind of an in, interview with this sort of book, I always think it's helpful if you can maybe hang a story on each of these just to help illustrate what you're talking about. Uh, so first, I'd love to have you talk to us about how do we rediscover that sense of wonder. And, and when I was looking at that part of the book, I was thinking of, I've got a bunch of kids they ask all kinds of questions. They're just curious about everything. And uh, we can respond to those questions or we can shut them down. And, and I know if we shut them down, they stop asking questions. And, and I think you just described that a, a moment ago. So how do we rediscover that sense of wonder? That's that so important. So well said. And, and for any of us who once were kids or have kids or your, uh, your nephews and nieces are asking you questions, their favorite one is always, why? And then you tell them why the sky's blue. And then you're like, they're like, why? And eventually it's like, because I said, so darn it, no, no, you know, eat, eat your, eat your Twinkies and get back to life, whatever you're doing over there. And so we put a squelch down and eventually kids stop asking. And not only do they stop asking, so do we, so do we. So man, the first sense is, and the idea of a sense, you have the ability to see and hear and touch and all these things. But as we age, we also lose the ability to see and to hear and to taste and to smell. That same, that same truth is also alive and well with these five senses that you and I are talking about. So sense number one is wonder. It is this ability to look at life through the lens of a child who has total awe for every single thing they experience and every single thing they do. First time I took my kids to a mall that I can remember, we took the escalator ride up and they, they were like blown away that their feet weren't moving. And yet we somehow were elevating through the shopping mall. They insisted we go back down and then they insisted we go back up again. And for me and for most adults, like it's boring. You know, like we, we check our phone during this time. They're not. They, they are in awe. A simple walk around the block. When you and I take it, Sean, it would take us three minutes. With a child, it's going to take 30 because there's inchworms and there's leaves and there's flowers, dandelions. It's all awesome. It's all awesome. And as we progress forward, we lose the sense of that. One of my favorite, it's a part of this book, but we quote Billy Crystal when he's, when he's telling the kids during City Slickers about what life is like when they're older. And, and it is just full of monotony and misery and then eventually death. And as he's speaking to these group of third graders, they're looking at him like, what is wrong with this guy? Because there's a complete disconnect between where Billy Crystal is as a radio salesperson, that's his job, and where these kids are, where everything is awesome. It's not just a song in the Lego movie. They actually believe it to be true. And so kids come into the day, we call it first time living, and it changes what they see, but it also changes the questions they ask. So like, why? And who says? And what if? And why not? And these are questions that not only do children ask, but the best among us, those who do things that it, Steve Jobs JFK, when he talked about going to the moon and back by the end of the decade, that's a pretty ambitious goal when the technology to get there has not been invented, let alone put together, let alone funded. And yet at Rice University, the vision was cast. And there's something wild about a vision that says, we're going to do this. We are going to do this. Kids do this all the time. And I think there's a lot we can learn from kids. Another big problem I'd like to have us focus on for a moment is that we've all lost the ability to keep our attention fully engaged in the moment. This happens on a daily basis in my own home when I'm talking to my wife and my phone's buzzing in my pocket and I'm like, oh, do I need to answer that email or should I really give her my full attention? Which, yes, I should, but yet I feel called to all these other distractions. Um, and you know, I, when we were younger, I don't feel like it was quite as bad, but now there's just distractions um, all around us. So in terms of learning to be immersed, learning to be fully engaged with our kids, our friends, our wife, just those around us, how do we rediscover that ability to be immersed? Awesome. So I'm, I'm going I'm to take a broad perspective on this and then we'll get more narrow. But you, you, you said you like the story. So one of the stories that was in this book was a, a visit I had with a business owner probably 12 years ago or so now. 
And I walked into his room, had not met this guy before. It was a uh, contact I was making professionally for various reasons. I served as a hospital chaplain for several years. And so I walk into this guy's room, never met him before. The room is gray. There are no flowers. There are no cards. It's dead. It's lifeless. And I sit down next to him and we just start hanging out. And he said, John, talk to me a couple of years ago. And you would have seen a man who was established and successful. And he started talking about the business he grew. And then he said, and yet on the journey towards success, I lost sight of the things that actually mattered. He said, uh, I was gone so much that I lost my marriage. And I focused on the wrong things so much thereafter that I lost the relationship with my three daughters. And I started spinning out of control, which is why I chose alcohol and drugs. I eventually lost the business. And now I find myself slowly wilting away, dying here. And then he, it's a congestive heart failure that he was dying of. Then he looked out the window. He looked back at me and he said something I'll never forget, Sean. John, I've gotten to the end of my life and I've realized I've climbed the ladder to the tippity top. And now I've realized I've leaned it against the wrong damn wall. I've got to the very end of my life. I've climbed to the very top and I realize I've leaned it against the wrong dang wall. And I think frequently, strategically, this is something we are all at risk of doing when we are sprinting and multitasking and racing through our lives of just achieving and sometimes not even sure exactly why. Why are we climbing? And is it the right ladder? And is it against the right wall? And is it on the right foundation? So from a strategic side to answer your question, I would encourage people and what a gift sometimes slowing down can be. And here we are nationally, maybe for the first time in a century, we have been forced, mandated, to slow down. This can be a gift if we choose to see it through the right lens. It's not easy. I'm not saying there's not headwind and challenges, but this can be a forced pause. A forced pause can be a gift. So that the, the first is the strategic to make sure you're leaning your ladder against the right wall. And the second, back to your multitasking question, all research, all research says multitasking is a bad idea. It, it's better to sleep one hour a night than it is to multitask. It is better to work while you're slightly drunk than to multitask. It is better to smoke weed while working than to multitask. But for some reason, when the phone vibrates, we think it's better to answer that, talk to our wife, raise our kids, do dinner, and respond to the email. And it's failing us. So what I try to do, what, what kids do naturally, we call it the, the, the uh, rest, play, work, repeat. Kids do this naturally in schools. When they're working, they're doing science. When they're at recess, they're doing kickball. When they're eating, they're doing lunch. They do a little nap time, and then they do more English, and they, do, they wash, repeat. They do it again and again and again. And yet you and I are trying to have dinner with our family. We're returning emails. The CNN's up on the, on the screen. None of it's happening effectively, though. So uh, when I'm at home, one thing I do, listeners, is this beautiful device. I have one, too. When I'm home, it's off. When I'm at work, man, I'm going to work like a champion. I'm going to work like a dog. But when I'm home, I play like a puppy. And so there, there's, there's benefits, I think, to really being laser focused when you're at work. Uh, don't be at home when you're at work. But when you are at home, don't be at work. Very good. Very sound advice. I, I like that latter illustration. That's very, very helpful. Uh, so we've covered two of the five senses. That's the, the two that we're going to be able to touch on in depth. But I want to make sure people have a preview of the other three. So what are the other three senses in the book. We talked about wonder. We talked about immersion. What are the other three? So expectancy is the first one, which is a fancy way of saying what you think will happen frequently does. And we have all kinds of phenomenal research and beautiful stories around this. But if you think something's going to happen and you move in that direction, and I'm not referring to the secret here, this is not a secret. This is the audacity to actually arrive on the scene, believing that this next thing will happen. And one of the difficulties that pharmaceutical companies are having is when people think they're going to get better. They do. They do. And so sugar pills, shockingly, are as effective frequently as the actual pills they are testing for. It works both positively and negatively. A lot of cool research on that, a lot of cool stories around this idea of how do you show up expecting great things to happen and how do you show up? This is as important, not expecting the worst to happen. And what I'll tell you right now is the media has done a phenomenal job for years. It's not just COVID-19, but for years reminding us the worst days are coming, more at 10. And so if you want to get a little bit more out of life, you want to be mindful on what kind of information you're taking in because what you take in will affect how you show up. So that's expectancy. The, the fourth piece is belonging. It might be my favorite sense, but kids, <laughs> man, they, they, they're home where they are. You bring your kids over to my house and like their shoes are going to be off. They're going to be laying on the couch as if they own the place 30 seconds in. They, they, they belong where they are. But it's not only like how they show up, it's how they connect with those around them. And so uh, we teach, 
I think pretty beautifully about how it, how important it is again to show as if you matter, as if your life is profoundly important because it is. Last year in the United States, before COVID-19, before the market fell, before unemployment started elevating, 1.5 million Americans attempted suicide. And so this is, it's partially mental health. It's partially this idea that we don't belong. It's partially this idea that we no longer have this deep friendship with those around us. Millennials, less than 30% believe they have a dear friend in their life in whom they can rely on. This is chronic. This is chronic. So we're trying to teach people in that sense about how to belong again. First, the person staring back at you in the mirror. You got to start there. But then to open up the marketplace a little bit more wide and to connect with those around you authentically. So we want people to belong. Um, big time. That's a beautiful sense. And the fifth one, the one that, that allows you to uh, liberate the others is the sense of freedom. Kids show up unabashedly who they are. And I think we show up frequently tied by mistakes we've made, mistakes others have made, decisions that someone else might make tomorrow. We live very infrequently in the present. We live chained either to yesterday or what might happen tomorrow. And so the final sense is about freeing yourself from all this stuff that binds you from being who you are called to be, which also allows you to be more effective in whatever you're doing. So when you're at work, how do you be more effective there? But also when you're at home, how do you soak up the joy, the fiber of this moment? And freedom is, is the next step toward that. Well, John, as I consider the release date for your book, I can't help but have a sense of divine timing. And I'd love to have you, as we begin to wrap up, share your heart for how you'd like this book to impact every person who is searching for meaning, joy, and inspiration. And, and what I'm believing and what I'm hoping will be a soon-to-be post-coronavirus world. How do you want this book, this message to impact people? Awesome, man. So it's, it's an awesome question. And, and the reality is I wrote this book as a way to get people to slow down to get people to take more walks, to get people to come hand in hand with your family a little bit more, to get people to make sure they're climbing the right ladder, to get people to reanalyze what success looks like and what it looks like specifically for you, not your neighbor, not your mama, not your, no, what does it mean for you? What does life look like when it's well lived for you? Have you slowed down lately to think about this reader? And now we've had months to actually be forced but here's the deal. You keep hearing people talk about, man, it's like Groundhog Day and I'm hating it. What people forget in Groundhog Day, Billy Crystal learned how to play the, classically the piano. He learned how to play the jazz piano. He learned French. He learned how to dance. He learned how to become a far better version of, of himself. And he did not forget it when Groundhog Day finally changed in, into the new day. And so my hope for In Awe is it reminds you what you once knew to be true, how life was once so packed with joy, how you can return to it post COVID-19. But what I'm telling you right now, you don't have to wait for it. Like why wait? So I'm, I'm begging people to start waking up to the gift that is their life. One of the stats we unpack in the book in awe is that there is less than a one in 400 trillion chance of you being in this world of your mother. We won't unpack the biology on this podcast. Bring me back for that one. We'll make it a 10 o'clock PM night podcast for biology. Uh, your mom and your dad with all that they have within them already, the likelihood of you being on this world is less than one in 400 trillion. So your life is no joke. It's not a cosmic accident. I believe it is divinely created. I believe you are here with a purpose, with a mission, and our job now is to unpack what it looks like and live it fully going forward. And one more thing I wanted to have you comment on, John, before we wrap up. Tell us about the In Awe 21 Day Challenge. Awesome. So like for me, our family has been impacted by suicide and depression. Many of my friends have been impacted by this. And so on the front side of COVID-19, as businesses were starting to shutter and as families were starting to get scared, we recognized that there would be a mighty need to feel together and to bring on an awful lot more hope and perspective. I think those two play hand in hand. A, a big part of expectancy, that second sense, is unpacking hope and, and the reverse of it, which is learned helplessness. So I, I was concerned about people giving up on hope, tying into despair and believing in learned helplessness. So to fight back against that, we offered a free 21 day challenge. It's called the In Awe 21 day challenge. Every single day I email people a little reminder, a little bit of perspective, a little bit of hope and a simple challenge to step into it. So it's, it's been incredibly well received. Thousands and thousands of people have stepped into it. Uh, really cool feedback on that. So if you're interested in taking the In Awe Challenge, join me at readinawe.com. 
the challenges again at readinawe.com. I will be there to greet you and I will see you the following morning. It's going to be an awesome 21 days. Well, like we do with every episode, we'll have detailed links in the show notes, places where you can connect with John and pick up your own copy of his great new book. It's time to bring this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with John O'Leary. Once again, our book today was In Awe, Rediscover Your Childlike Wonder to Unleash Inspiration, Meaning, and Joy. Again, if you want to connect with John and find out more, two places you could go. Uh, We didn't mention this earlier, but you can learn more at his website, johnolearyinspires.com. And if you want to take part in the In Awe 21-Day Challenge and find out more about the book, the place you need to go right now is readinawe.com. John, I just want to thank you so much for sharing with us today. You're truly an inspiration and an encouragement. And I know this is going to greatly bless my audience. I appreciate it, sir. Let, let me just say this. My, my editors are always trying to put my picture on the front of books. They're not on the front of the books. They're not on the back of the books because my books aren't written for ego. They're written for people to understand the beauty of their lives and how to take the next step to make them even better. So uh, On Fire has these cool mirrored images of like little flames that make the words On Fire. It's an awesome read. But the book in awe, simple book, white lettering, and this big, brilliant red kite flying high. And we, we put that out there when people were kind of chained to, uh, to the monotony of the day. But I'm telling you right now, there's an opportunity to go outside, for those of us who can, to look up and to see possibility again. So uh, check out In Awe. I promise you guys, I promise you ladies and friends, you're going to love it. So it's a book about life and ultimately it's your life. <laughs>